My name is Kevin Harris. I am a local independent filmmaker. On Sunday the 26th of August 1984, I covered a community meeting held at Father Jeff Mosolani's parish in Sharpville. A week later, on Monday the 3rd of September, Sharpville erupted in violence. It was a long time coming. Resentment at the complicity of black councillors with the apartheid regime ran high that day. As the Vaal erupted, five councillors lost their lives. From Monday the 3rd of September 1984, South Africa was never the same again. A year later, on the 16th of October 1985, in a small farming community some 70 kilometers east of Johannesburg, the so-named Delmos Treason Trial got underway. Three members of the United Democratic Front leadership, 18 activists and one priest, all linked to events that took place in the Vaal in 1984, made up the 22 accused. They were charged with treason, subversion, terrorism and murder. Activist Tom Mantata was a field worker with the South African Council of Churches. The priest was Father Jeff Mosolani. The main charge in the Delmas trial against all the accused, including uh, Father Mosolani and uh, Tom Mantata, was treason with alternatives under the Terrorism Act and other statutory offences. So Key to the state's case in the Vaal was the meeting hosted in Sharpville by Father Mosolani on Sunday the 26th of August 1984. In building its case, the state was unaware that we had filmed the meeting that day. For Father Mosolani and Tom Mantata, their very lives depended on interpretation by the judge as to whether or not they had incited violence at this and previous meetings held in the Vaal. We must test it. Eighteen months into the trial, I was introduced as a surprise witness for the defense. All film footage shot, plus extensive audio recordings taken on the 26th of August 1984 during the meeting, were submitted by the defense as exhibits 36 to 40, respectively. It came as quite a surprise, um, but when we were preparing the accused for their evidence, Father Jeff Mosolani remembered that Harris had been there and had filmed himself and, and, and this meeting. For the defense, it was a moment of welcome respite. This was the first concrete evidence to refute claims fabricated by the state that during meetings in the Vaal, Father Mosolani and Tom Mantata had incited the community to violence. It was very important for us because the state was attempting to sketch a picture of treason, subversion and conspiracy. Whereas Kevin Harris, the film that he made was real evidence that showed that this was in fact an organic response to um, the kind of oppression that was going on in the townships. Video and audio tapes of very important pieces of evidence which if they contradict the uh, oral testimony of a witness are very difficult to ignore. The state, taken by surprise, requested time to analyze the evidence submitted. It was six months later, Monday the 2nd of November 1987, when I stepped back into the dock. By then the trial had moved from Delmos. The courtroom drama was now being played out in the Palace of Justice, Pretoria. In the interim, the state had not been idle, and I found myself up against South African police and military forensic specialist, Professor Brigadier Janssen. I analyzed the audio part of the recording the same way I analyze all other recordings essentially looking for suspicious clicks or pulses and in this case I did find some I did find some pulses which could not be explained easily in any other manner 
So I was forced to come to the conclusion that there may have been de deliberate tampering with the recordings. Based on Brigadier Janssen's empirical findings, the state accused me of tampering with the integrity of the film and audio material submitted. The prosecutor made a case that the master audio soundtrack submitted by myself was not the original, but in fact a dubbed copy. The state then argued that this dubbed copy had been deliberately edited so as to exclude a middle section of the meeting, during which time the Reverend Mossolani and other speakers took to the platform and made their inciting speeches. We went to my laboratory and I showed him on the oscilloscope the pulses that I was talking about. Completely unusual pulses, not natural to any recording. And as far as I remember, Harris conceded that he did see pulses and that he didn't know how they, did, uh, how they should be explained. I was absolutely dumbfounded. Having filmed the meeting in question, I knew the state's claims were crazy, but hard to prove it. The only way was to come up with a counter scenario. But what? The evidence was there. The brigadier had shown me the oscilloscope readings at the lab, and I had to concede to the court that the scenario suggested was feasible. The judge gave me two days to come up with an answer. I didn't sleep well that night. For those caught up in the turmoil of South Africa in the 1980s, there were many roads that led to Delmos. For the 22 accused, all black activists fighting oppression and the injustice of apartheid, there was some inevitability. We are all products of our environment and life experience. The script has been written. But for others, take myself as an example, a 34-year-old white South African filmmaker, I happen across a crucial meeting in the remote township of Sharpville on the 26th of August 1984. Seemingly, the script is not so clear. Where does the journey begin? How does it lead to Delmos? Is it destiny or just a series of coincidences? Art imitates life, or is it the other way around? Looking to the conventions of script writing, let's analyze the protagonist in the movie, Zotzi. In Act 1, we establish his character and everyday environment. Sotsi is a mean, heartless township thug. Going about his everyday business, one night, something out of the ordinary happens. It's known as the inciting incident, a disruption that changes his life forever. The inciting incident sends him on a journey in pursuit of a goal. There's an obligatory scene set up by the incident where he is faced with a critical moral decision. Mufido in. In the final act, striving for his goal, the protagonist's character arcs as he realizes his innermost need. It's the stuff of many successful movies. So much for Sotsi. The film took the Oscar for South Africa in 2006. As the protagonist in my life, a screenplay, it was never my intention to become a political activist. I wanted to be a filmmaker. If anything, I was a concerned South African. Whites lived in a bubble of convenient ignorance. I was outraged. I felt a strong sense of obligation as a South African to make films about what was really happening in this country. So no one could say I didn't know. And also to mobilize the international community to keep the South African issue on the front burner. This is Hillcrest, small village on the old main road halfway between Durban and Pietermaritzburg. 
1956, Meet the Harris Family. That's me, Dalmas Kevin, on my first day at school. My sister Jeanette is two classes ahead in Standard 1. My father, Wig, is secretary of the Hillcrest Government Hospital. We live across the road from the school where my mother, Joyce, plays the piano and teaches the children singing. Headmistress Miss Seymour, in her journal entry of December 6th, 1956, notes the gift of a box of handkerchiefs given to Mrs. Harris in appreciation for her charitable services to the school. Mrs. Harris must have been important in my life because she's the only music teacher that I actually remember in all my school years. And um, I can actually remember her being right here in this room with her piano and us all sitting at wooden benches and learning all these lovely old ballads that she used to teach us. Um, a very warm, caring person. It's a very small government school, class one to standard one, some 30 children. There's a great community spirit and my father Wig coaches us soccer twice a week in the late afternoon. Jeanette excels at athletics and later that year takes the Victrix Lodorum. My father, Wig, is also Old Bill of the Hillcrest Highway shell hole. If I was to identify an inciting incident in my life, there would actually be two. The first was the tragic and violent death of my father, Wig. It was September 1962. We'd been living happily as a family in Hillcrest for six years. I was in Standard 5, my final year at Hillcrest Government School. My sister Jeanette had moved on, blazing a trail in athletics and hockey. She was a rising star at Westville Government School. She was also a natural on the piano. I have vivid memories of her rendition of the theme from Exodus. Turning 12, I idolized my father. He was a really good man, helping families in distress through programs run by the moths. The community loved him. He loved guns. In fact, he taught the wives how to shoot on Saturday afternoons at the Moth Hall. My father's favorite movie was Gary Cooper in High Noon. The soundtrack was his signature tune. Come to think of it, the first movies I remember were westerns. I also loved guns. In fact, I shot birds. In High Noon, the citizens of Hadleyville are terrorized by the Frank Miller gang. Will Kane, played by Gary Cooper, is a quiet man with a strong parochial sense of justice. Making a stand, he takes on the job of Marshall and reclaims the streets of Hadleyville. But the jury back east lets the gang off. As the clock counts down, Frank Miller's on the noon train. He's coming back to meet up with his old gang and reclaim the town. The good folks of Hadleyville turn their backs on Will Kane. They want no trouble with Frank Miller and his gang. They want Will to leave town. But the script's been written. Will Kane could never run. My father identified with Gary Cooper. A classic scenario, the selfless action by an ordinary man in the bittersweet triumph of good against evil. In the script of life, as in feature films, there are meaningful coincidences, recurring undercurrents that resonate. For me, one must surely be the coming of September. In 1984, events of the 3rd of September, to which I was witness, changed the course of South African history. In 1962, on the 4th of September, the sudden and violent death of my father changed my life forever. On the morning of Tuesday the 4th, September 1962, Wig Harris, no doubt having kissed his wife Joyce goodbye, walked down the garden path and through the gate that linked their home to the hospital gardens. Preparing for his trip to the bank to fetch the weekly payroll, he goes to the office safe and takes out the .22 revolver. It's just another day, but for Wig Harris, at age 46, it was to be his last. I just remember I was at school in Standard 6 at Westville, we were co at the time, and the headmaster came to fetch me from the classroom. And when I got to the front of the school, my aunt and uncle were there. And they just broke the news to me. Funny enough, I remember very clearly that day. Um, I can remember the exact classroom we were sitting in. 
and I don't recall if it was the headmaster or a, another teacher came in and called uh, the teacher out the class and took Jeanette out and then we heard afterwards what had actually happened. I remember that morning so clearly. Mrs. Nell was taking us for Afrikaans. My Uncle Percy appeared at the door. The two of them spoke and she called me over. It was all very calm. She looked at me and said, you poor child. At the time, I didn't think anything of it. I can't remember much detail. I remember he worked at Hillcrest Hospital and uh, something had happened. Um, he was taking a gun out of a safe, something to that effect, and, uh, but I don't recall the detail of that. He had been ill. He'd had shingles. And that, that very day that he was killed, he had said to my mother that he was going now to the hospital to put in for leave. But first he would have to pay the staff. It was the, the very first time that any of us were ever exposed to tragedy. You know, we all lived such safe lives and such happy lives and we all had a mummy and we all had a daddy. And then all of a sudden one day Mrs. Harris wasn't, wasn't at school and we were told that her husband had died. And she never came back again. He used the gun, wore it to go and draw money from the bank, came back and threw the gun into the safe. And with that, his works manager came in. He said to him, I need you to sign some papers. He opened the safe and crouched down in front of it. And instead of taking the gun out first and putting the catch on, he pulled the papers out from underneath it. And apparently that was it. The gun went off and he was killed immediately. The official report and testimony from the late Jack Calder, the only witness present, declared it a tragic accident. You know, he was so comfortable around guns because he even took the moth's wives. He taught them how to shoot, how to dismantle a gun, how to put it back together again. And it just shows you how ill he probably was that day from shingles to forget to do the most simplest and the, probably the thing that he told them a hundred times that they had to do was to put the safety catch on the gun. As with most of the community that day, Mr. Merritt, then principal of the school, takes time off to attend Wig Harris's cremation. In their minutes of September 6, 1962, the moths record their shock and condolences to the Harris family. In loving memory, Hillcrest Government School is presented with the Wig Harris Memorial Floating Trophy. At the end of your presentations, Joyce Harris receives a final farewell gift from the school. The death of my father changed everything. Was this the start of the road to Delmas? We had to leave the house. My mother had to get a job. The community came to the rescue. There was a vacancy for matron of junior house at Kersney College. An ideal position for Joyce? There was a small flat attached. Kevin and Jeanette could stay with her. And of course, this would enable Kevin access to privileged education at Kersney College. First ball. At the time, that was the last thing I wanted. I was a government school boy, and happily so. The free spirit, I had absolutely no fascination for being regimented and knocked into shape. Particularly not in the mold of Victorian style discipline and the tradition of the English private school. That and the pain of separation brought about by the loss of my father made my first year at Kersney a difficult one. But I was not alone. In junior house there were plenty of homesick little boys. My mother was great. She rose to the occasion. She really came into her own. I found it uh, at the time it was a bit of a fight for survival. Sister Harris's uh, flat or home Remember very, very well, when you went into the entra entrance of uh, a junior house, uh, as you walked through the front door, there was a, a door on the left. I remember her, and I remember her daughter, Jeanette, and I remember their son, Kevin, who was also a scholar at the school, I think a year above me. And uh, what I remember very, very clearly that this this was like a home. So the rest of the school was a very, very uh, confrontational environment on all levels. I found that this little door was sort of an oasis of humanity. Behind that door was actually a human being. There, there was this, this uh, 
uh, feeling that there was a, a touch of humanity there. There was a, a, a real mother there. There was a real empathetic, caring person behind that door. In that first year, I lived for the weekends. My Auntie Lucy and Uncle Percy, who stayed in Westville, became my surrogate parents. An unsophisticated couple, they treated me like the son they never had. The love they showed me was totally unconditional. Their spare back room became my home. It was a great neighborhood where I met some of my best friends ever. We formed a band, We're Still Thinking. The Animals, Hendrix, Yardbirds, The Kinks, we covered them all. Kevin was at school at Kersney at that stage. We used to practice in the garage at my folks' house, uh, much to the detriment of the neighbours. We used to play quite a lot, in the, practicing in the garage, and then on Saturday nights, I think, as well. And then we played out at a few gigs. I recall um, the Tech in Durban, which was a bit of an embarrassment, because we were double booked with one of the best bands in town at the time. Played at a few house parties around Westfall. And then there was at the German Fair. I think we played for about a week down there. But it was a good experience, you know, earn enough money to go and buy a pie, gravy and chips in those days. We didn't exactly get fan mail, but people did sit up and take notice. This particular neighbour, if nothing else, appreciated our need for practice. In August 1966, memorial gates built at the highway shell hole in honour of Old Bill Wig Harris were consecrated. A pipe band from Natal Mounted Rifles played The Lament. Two Kersney cadets played the last post. To this day, Wig Harris's ashes lie at rest in the stone pillar, marked by a memorial plaque. In spite of myself, I did get a lot from my five years at Kersney College. I made some really good friends, achieved academically, and opened the bowling for the first 11. Being good with a gun, I was in the shooting team. I matriculated in 1967. Then came the army, nine months at Voortrekker Hoogte. For some of us it was tough to be invisible. Also I came to a realization brought on by the brutality of the system of what it might be like to be black in South Africa. My discharge certificate ten years later was for me a proud badge of integrity a record of non-participation in a system that represented everything I found reprehensible. 1969, I went to Durban University. Career counselling was not big in those days. Good in maths and science, not knowing any better, I did engineering. My classmates were good guys, but conservative, even reactionary. They drank a lot of beer, read Scope magazine and lived rugby. But campus life offered more. New horizons, exposure to new perspectives. Salvador Dali, Dada, film societies, existentialism, John Paul Sartre and Albert Camus. Even Kenneth Clark's civilization. Good years that consisted mainly of play. I realized early on that I was never going to work as an engineer. In the back of my mind, my degree was just something I was required to do. With an electronics background, the band, maybe I'd become a record producer, I wasn't sure. Then in final year, 1973, the SABC came recruiting. It seemed a big enough place, with lots of different stuff going on, maybe I could find something there. In February 1974, I reported as an engineer to Auckland Park, Johannesburg. It was two years to switch on. The first television training course had just got underway. When considering a possible career, no one had ever offered being a filmmaker. It wasn't an option, until now. The moment I walked into the studio, I knew I had found my destiny. This is what I wanted to do. Those first two years were great. Everyone was young and totally inspired. It was a wonderful opportunity. We were working in the world of movies. Television got off the ground through youthful enthusiasm. Then Prime Minister John Foster was somewhat less enthusiastic, but even he, in his opening address, reluctantly accepted the inevitability of the historic moment. Already we can see how easy it is to create and instill 
wrong impressions about peoples and countries, by slanted news and pictures, an unbalanced presentation of facts. If my father's untimely death was the first, my being fired from the SABC was definitely the second inciting incident which changed the direction of my life irreversibly. In 1976, I was made a junior producer in the English documentary department. Every programme made had to be vetted and approved by management before broadcast. It was unquestioned that the National Party government controlled the SABC. In spite of this, some producers genuinely believed they could make a difference. I can recall very clearly editing a production in which uh, there was a clash between demonstrating Witz students and police. And a policeman at one point reached over quite blatantly, grabbed a woman by her breast and looked at her as if to say, and what are you going to do about it? We had a look at it and wondered whether we would get away with it uh, because it happened very quickly and maybe they wouldn't notice it, you know, when they went to the viewing. But then we thought on balance they probably would and if they did, then they'd start looking for other things and then we'd lose another piece and another piece. So in the end we decided, look, you know, let's, let's rather cut it. And it's just a small thing, you see, but you go from there to cutting the next one and the next one. And the worst thing is when you start doing it yourself. Ultimately, what you'd end up with is a program that, in a sense, was a total whitewash of the issue that you set out to make. By 1977, some 10 senior producers had resigned in frustration and disgust at management's manipulation of the English documentary department. In 1979, I found myself at the crossroads. I think the Baraguanath incident is a good example of the way in which the censorship strategy worked. I was to make a one-hour special documentary on Baraguanath Hospital. For me, it was very special because, as a filmmaker, what I would do is I would use the hospital to mirror the social environmental conditions of the community that it served, namely Soweto. Management, however, got excited because they saw this as a wonderful opportunity to show what this wonderful hospital in other words, what whites were doing for the people of Soweto. So I went off, I shot the film, and because it was a management priority, there was a rush to get it screened. Management viewed the film, and there was quite a lot of debate within management as to whether or not the film should go out. Behind the scenes, the Afrikaner Brüderbund had the final say. On their instruction, I was to cut out the opening sequence. It was only three minutes, but it established the destitute social environmental conditions lived daily by the majority of Sowetans. My position was quite clear. Uh, I'd been there for five years. I'd seen the game that SABC management was playing with us. And I just felt that if I compromised on this small issue, then, I mean, I wouldn't have a leg to stand on in terms of other films that I wanted to make. That were, I mean, they were about serious issues. Um, and then it came to me, like a flash. I mean, in fact, the only thing that I could do was in fact to tell management that, yes, okay, I would cut out the opening sequence and then not cut it out. And that's exactly what I did. I must say that sitting and watching it go out with friends, there was a moment when I thought that they would have viewed the film and seen that I hadn't cut it and then censored it. But when I saw that first frame come up as it was broadcast, I just had this incredible feeling of relief that they hadn't cut it. It was such a small issue, but yeah, my film was being broadcast in its entirety. And I had absolutely no regrets about it. I was fired within 24 hours. It wasn't as if I set out to provoke a high profile incident. It was just something that happened. I think it was, it was an inevitable thing in terms of the game that management was playing with us that, you know, I had seen six, seven, eight producers uh, leave, resign through frustration. And I suppose in a sense it was inevitable that for me it, it, it would come to this. I wrote a memo to senior management explaining why I had taken such drastic action. I was fired within 24 hours. I must tell you that I initiated it. I initiated it, but yeah, if, if I didn't wield the, wield the axe, I certainly um, pushed the button, yeah. Baraguanath, 1978. Hillcrest Government Hospital, 1962. Another resonance. In fact, when I was making Barra, 
I included scenes shot on Christmas Eve of hospital staff passing through the wards singing carols. An image that had stayed with me from childhood. Memories of the annual Christmas party at Hillcrest Government Hospital. And so began my career as an independent filmmaker. But the outside industry was dependent on the SABC for contracts. If they were seen to be employing Kevin Harris, they may be penalised. But hey, at least my mother still loved me. I picked up bits and pieces of backroom film work. I painted houses. I had to make a decision, stay in South Africa or leave and set up a new life overseas. But with the bad came something good. It was at the SABC that I met my wife-to-be, Leslie Carvel. We were married on the 21st of March, Sharpville Day, in 1982. In weighing up the options, I decided that if I proved to myself that it was impossible to make socially relevant films from inside South Africa, only then would I pack up and leave. It took a while. But then I became aware of Bishop Desmond Tutu and the work of the South African Council of Churches. I convinced them that they needed a documentary. My first independent film was This We Can Do for Justice and for Peace. It focused on two central characters, Bishop Desmond Tutu and the Reverend Peter Storey, General Secretary and President of the South African Council of Churches, respectively. In this way, the documentary would articulate two concerned perspectives, one white, one black. The standpoint of the SACC against apartheid would provide the backdrop. It was 1979. My primary intention was that we should use the film to fight the South African censor board. We would do everything possible to confront white South Africans with what was being done in their name under apartheid. No one would be able to say we didn't know. The censor board ordered 13 cuts to the film. We fought them on appeal and won on every point. The documentary was approved for general viewing inside South Africa. South Africa today, tomorrow the world. I put the film under my arm and Leslie and I hopped on a plane. With the untempered confidence of youth, I walked the streets of London and New York, knocking on doors. In retrospect, I was extremely lucky. NBC broadcast the film nationwide across the USA under the title, Land of Fear, Land of Courage. They awarded it two Emmys. Elsewhere, the documentary was broadcast by ZDF Germany, ABC Australia and Norwegian Television. It was also being distributed worldwide through church and NGO networks. Our second objective had been achieved. The film was being used to keep the South African issue alive internationally. This We Can Do for Justice and for Peace established my working relationship with the South African Council of Churches. To access township and rural communities, I worked through field workers at the council. Wonderful people, it made me rethink the virtues of Christianity. I carried a letter from Bishop Desmond Tutu, endorsing my work and introducing me as a friend of the council. Tom Mantata was one of those special field workers I was privileged to get to know and work with. In 1983 I was working on two documentary projects, The Struggle From Within and No Middle Road to Freedom. In December 1982, SADF commandos had attacked and killed South African exiles living in Maseru. Innocent victims were slaughtered in their beds. In May 1983, in retaliation, ANC guerrillas detonated a car bomb on the streets of Pretoria. Innocent bystanders were caught up in the carnage. The South African government hit back with an air raid on Maputo. Again, innocent lives were lost. This new dynamic of tit-for-tat violence was the focus of No Middle Road to Freedom. 1983 was also the year of the Nationalist Party government's tricameral parliament. It was the final phase of the apartheid design, as envisioned by Dr. Favut. By granting second-rate rights to coloureds, Indians and urban blacks, the government would create a buffer between whites and the black majority. The Bantustan plan would be enforced with renewed vigour. Every single black person would be stripped of their South African citizenship. In response, a groundswell of mass grassroots opposition began to emerge. This was the focus of the struggle from within. We are 
are struggling for our human dignity and we are struggling for the future of our children, we shall never give up. Our cry is, and always will be, you can ban us, but you cannot break us. On the 20th of August 1983, the United Democratic Front was launched nationally at Mitchell's Plain. On July the 15th, 1984, the community of Tumohola took to the streets in protest at increased rentals imposed by corrupt community councillors. Police opened fire, shops and businesses of councillors were looted and burned. The road to Delmas was underway. It was at this time that I approached SACC field worker Tom Mantata. Community meetings were being organized to discuss strategies in opposition to the rent increases. There was to be a meeting at St. Cyprian's Church in Sharpville on Sunday. The priest's name was Father Masolani. Tom would tell him I was coming. With Bishop Tutu's letter in my back pocket, on Sunday the 26th of August 1984, I arrived at St. Cyprian's Church in Sharpville. With cameraman and equipment, I introduced myself to Father Jeff Masolani. He welcomed us warmly, and we set up in preparation for the meeting. When Naval erupted a week later, Father Masolani was not in Sharpville. He was attending the Anglican Synod in Johannesburg. On return, the township was in flames. His house had been tear-gassed and was surrounded by armed soldiers. Without recourse, he was detained and taken away. Over the next six months, the pattern was repeated. By early 1985, the 22 had all been detained and the Delmas treason trial got underway on the 16th of October that year. The struggle from within and no middle road to freedom completed. My concern was to get copies out of the country. This would draw international attention to the trial and to the plight of Tom Mantata and Father Masolani. At the same time, I was taking the censor board banning order on appeal. On the home front, Daniel, our firstborn, was two years old. Gabby, our baby daughter, arrived with the first state of emergency in November 1985. There was a total clampdown on all news reporting. International television agencies could operate in South Africa, only on the express condition that they towed the line. Only official reports issued by the South African security forces were allowed to be quoted. To devastating effect, the South African regime was controlling and manipulating what was being reported to the outside world. With the backing of the South African Council of Churches, I developed South Africa Now. A series of alternative grassroots reports designed to challenge the sanitized mainstream international network coverage of the South African issue. At regular intervals, I packaged and shipped an episode made up of four or five current stories. In London, copies were duplicated and shipped to church and NGO donor partners around the world. I met Dr. Fabian Ribeiro and did an episode on the police brutality witnessed and treated by him in his mamelody surgery. On March the 12th, 1986, he and his wife Florence escaped death when security forces bombed their home in the middle of the night. Nine months later, they were assassinated by unknown gunmen. During this time, I co-directed the documentary Witness to Apartheid with American producer Sharon Sofa. Broadcast on Channel 4 in the UK, Witness to Apartheid put the international spotlight squarely back on the brutality of the apartheid regime, operating under a cloak of immunity provided by the state of emergency. In America, the documentary was nominated for an Academy Award. It was March 1987 when we returned as a family from our trip to LA. The Delmas treason trial had been dragging on for almost two years. It was then that I noticed. The state was building an aspect of its case on the meeting held at Father Mossoloni's church in Sharpville on the 26th of August 1984. I called David Dyson and George Bezos. They watched the footage and I was introduced as a surprise witness for the defense. Stepping down from the dock in November 1987, I was truly at a loss. I could not understand or explain the four impulses detected by Brigadier Janssen on the master soundtrack. Then it struck me, probably in the middle of the night. 
When recording the meeting, I had used two microphones. In channel one was the microphone secured at the podium. In channel two was my handheld roving rifle mic. When we changed camera position with the machine still in record mode, I unplugged the cable from channel two. This created the first impulse. When we returned with the Inagra still running in record, I plugged the rifle mic back into channel two. This created the second impulse, similarly with pulses three and four. Begrudgingly, the prosecution had to concede that this was a feasible possibility. For me, it was a moment of immense relief. A year later, in November 1988, Judge van Dekhorst delivered his six-volume, 1,521-page judgment. Father Mussolini was one of those acquitted. Tom Mantato was one of five sentenced to Robben Island. I think Harris's evidence helped everybody because it's very important in political trials that one is able to put up objective pieces of evidence that gainsay the state's case. So in the overall symbolic sense for the case, the, 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 the film was very important. It did assist um, because um, the state was trying to show that um, my meetings here were very violent and we're doing nothing else except vilifying the councillors. Just to find that, um, you know, there was very much orderly and to show that, uh, that there was no much planned from Chaville. No sooner had the ink dried from the judge's pen than the defence lodged their appeal. In the first year of the trial, Judge van Dekos had dismissed one of his assessors, Professor Willem Jobert, without recourse. It was on this technicality that the appeal was lodged. On the 15th of December 1989, the Bloemfontein Supreme Court upheld the appeal and all sentences were overturned. For Terra Lakota, Popo Malefe, Mos Chikani, Tom Mantata, Krina Malindi and the rest of the 22 accused, the long road from Delmos was finally over. But for the protagonist in the final act, one last tragedy perhaps the obligatory scene. In Hillcrest, where the journey began, a final resonance. On my first day at school, I was met at the door by my class one teacher, Mrs. Sheila Greener. It was a small school. Mrs. Greener was one of four teachers. For my seven years at Hillcrest Government School, she took me for most of my subjects. She was there when my father was killed. At noon on Wednesday the 11th of October 1995, Mrs. Greener was shot dead in a hijacking attempt at the local garage in the village. Sadly, Mrs. Greener did not live to see the contribution her life's work has made to what is now Hillcrest Senior Primary School. For me, on my return visit, it was gratifying to see how the principal and staff have approached and instituted transformation. It is truly a model example. Across the way, Hillcrest Government Hospital is an inspiring and well-managed sanctuary. In beautiful, well-kept surroundings, it is an oasis of humanity. My father would have been proud. His ashes in the pillar of the memorial gates some 45 years later, Wig Harris's portrait still occupies pride of place on the wall of the Hillcrest Highway Shell Hall. Outside is a garden of remembrance, a final resting place for comrades in arms. Kersney College is the best it's ever been. In the spirit of the new South Africa, the rod has given way to reason. Where there was once brutal enforcement of mindless authority, today there is mentorship. It is an institution with which I am proud to be associated. I'd like to welcome to our chapel service this morning an old boy, Mr. Kevin Harris, and we're greatly honoured that he has identified his experience at Kersney as one of those important aspects of his life. So I think we can put our hands together and give him a warm Kersney welcome.